Good morning. Off the flying start. Morning. We're getting back in our cool story, bro. And today, I think you're like the title. The F word. The F word. No, not that F word. The F word we're talking about today is forgiveness. And sometimes we treat that like an, like an F word. Uh, let's pray. God, thanks for today. Thank you for your love and your grace and the good things you're doing for us. God, I pray that you would open our hearts this morning, that the words of my mouth would be from you, God. Such an important topic, Father. I pray you'll just bless our, our ears to hear, my mouth to speak, God, and that all of us would follow after you. Thanks. Amen. All right. If you remember uh, when Jay Leno did The Tonight Show, he would always do headlines. And these weren't these weren't things that they made up. These were headlines they found in newspapers that were funny. So like one of them was a security firm loses Oakland Airport. Well, the airport's pretty big. How do you lose the whole airport? Um, another one read, seven of the nine commissioners voted unanimously. It would take nine commissioners. It's really early, you guys. Okay. Uh, and then one more, it said, in last week's issue, a picture showed some very unusual oriental dishes that were enjoyed by a party of foreign exchange students. Me Thi Thin is a foreign exchange student who is standing at the center of the picture. We incorrectly listed her name as one of the items on the menu. <laughs> we regret the error. Of course you do. Look, we make mistakes. Every one of us makes mistakes. You do, I, well, I don't. You guys do, no, <laughs> trust me. Follow me around for five minutes, you, it won't be hard to find my mistakes. Uh, the question is, how do you move on from there? Now, little mistakes are one thing, but the big mistakes we make in life, those can be huge and those can be damaging. So how do you move on once you get past the big mistakes? Well, you're gonna sit down and wallow in self-pity or are you gonna follow and ask God for his forgiveness? So that's kind of where we're at this morning. We're going to look at a passage of scripture where Jesus talks about this. So, let's look at it. First of all, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 40. So you got your Bible, and you should have your Bible. Check it out. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 40. When I was a kid, we used to remember the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all had four noses ten feet long. I don't think that's really... Very nice, but that's where we learned it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his, to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman, now look who this is. This is an immoral woman. A certain immoral woman from that city heard he was going there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. And she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, talking about Jesus, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Pretty judgmental. Pretty judgy. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. So let's, let's get some, some historical context here. The Jews had a thing called sitting at table. And so what you would do is you would sit together around this big table, all the food in the middle, and you would, you would lay on pillows <coughs> and you would put your left elbow on the table and you would eat with your right hand. And you would extend your feet away because your feet were considered unclean. So you didn't want them anywhere near the table. And then oftentimes servants would come and wash your feet while you're eating dinner, that kind of thing. So religious leaders would often open their homes to the poor while they're having these, these, these dinners, which seems kind of bizarre to me. But they were supposed to sit on the outskirts of the room and not approach the table and definitely not talk to anybody. They were there. Then when everything was done, they could come to the table and get whatever was left over if they wanted. So you see the setting? 
So there are people on the outside of the room that are, there are invited guests, but not really like Jesus. Jesus and his disciples were invited guests. They were like the guests of honor. They got to sit at the table. Everybody else had to go sit in the cheap seats. And that's what's going on here. They're sitting in the cheaps. But suddenly, a woman comes forward. And the historical tradition is always held that she was a prostitute. Either way, she's considered an immoral woman. And the Pharisee kind of lifts his nose up at her. Says, look at this woman. Now, I got a feeling that at some point, this woman had an encounter with Jesus. At some point, she had heard him speak. Something about Jesus had touched her life. She didn't have a towel and a basin of water. She didn't have all that stuff. She wanted to show Jesus respect, so she took an alabaster box. Now, we don't understand alabaster box. Today, it would be a box made out of pure gold. And the oil inside is very, very uh, expensive. So this woman gave what she had. And she anointed Jesus' feet and put the oil on his feet and cleaned them up. And all of a sudden, I can almost see it, she realized she didn't have a towel. What am I going to do? So she used what she had. She used her hair. How, how, how much love, how much beauty is in this little, this, this little act of devotion? She's, she's risking everything to come forward and talk to this guy. Or not even talk to him, just to start washing his feet. She was an outcast. Her, her whole thing, even her being there was probably considered unacceptable because she was unclean. She was a prostitute. She was immoral. And yet she comes forward and she kisses Jesus' feet. Uh, the Talmud said that a woman could be a divorce for letting down her hair in the presence of another man. I mean, so she's making this, she's, she's just making this even worse. She, she's an immoral woman. She comes over to Jesus. She's supposed to stay in the cheap seats and shut up and then hope for some crumbs at the end. Then she comes over and she lets down her hair in, in, in public and then why, you know, wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. This, now when you read this story, you think, this is amazing. If she had uncovered her breasts, it would have been the same thing. That's, that's, how, that's how risky this move is. That's how it's considered uncouth. And yet she did it. And the Pharisee, he's sitting there, he's, he's speechless, he can't believe what's going on. He doesn't say anything, but he definitely thinks it. You can almost hear him in his head. This dude thinks he's a prophet, but he's not even smart enough to know that some hooker is washing his, his feet with, with, with her hair. So what's, what's wrong here? Thing is, you don't, you don't get by with that with Jesus around. Okay, you don't, you don't get to do that. Jesus knew what he was thinking. And so he calls him on it. And that's where you get to the story. The story is not long. In fact, of all the parables we, we're going to talk about, this is probably one of the shortest. Luke chapter 7, verse 41. Then Jesus told them this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? So let's put this in today's terms. 500, uh, a, a denarii was one day's worth of work. Okay, so... Let's say you got a job making a hundred bucks a day, which is cheap today, a hundred bucks a day. If you worked 500 days, like this, this first guy is forgiven 500 days worth of work. The other guy's forgiven 50. And they both owed a large sum of money. So uh, we're talking about one guy that, that needed 20 months to work off the debt and the other guy that needed two months. And Jesus said, the banker, he's got a lot of options. That banker could put them into prison, 
He could have them killed for owing that much money and not. But, and I realize I'm not a banker, but I kind of get the feeling they're just saying, ah, it's all right, you don't have to pay me back. It's probably not a good business practice for bankers. I'm thinking that bankers, you know, like to get the money back that they loan out. I know when I rented, when I, when I bought a house, the mortgage company really wanted their payment every month. When I bought a car, the car company really wanted that payment every month. In fact, if you ever think that nobody cares about you and that nobody cares if you're alive, take out a loan. Because I guarantee you, somebody will care whether or not you're alive then. So the other money lenders are looking at this guy and say, wait a second, you moron. You just gave up 20 months worth of, worth of rent to this guy. He, he owed you, and so you're going to make fun of him at parties. Oh, look, look, here's a big philanthropist, you moron. But despite the risk, he forgave him. Despite all of that risk, he forgave him. So this story comes with a stinger. I just like calling it that, the stinger. We are indebted to God at a price that we cannot repay. And he wants to forgive us. So you don't have to be a brilliant biblical scholar to realize that what Jesus is saying to this, this, this Pharisee is, this woman has been forgiven a huge debt in her life. She's immoral. Yes, she's done wrong. She's been forgiven a lot. And she loves me more than you do. We're in that same boat. If you think about the debt that we pay to Jesus, that we owe to Jesus, the, the, the debt of our salvation, the, the debt of him watching over us, taking care of us, how do you repay that? That's more than 500 days of work. How, how, do, we re, how do you repay that debt? And the bottom line is you can't. You can't. This parable isn't talking about the amount of sin in the heart, but rather the acknowledgement that there is a sin. We have all sinned. Both of these individuals were in debt and couldn't pay the debt. We're all sinners and cannot reconcile ourselves to God. You cannot earn your way into God's grace. Okay? Working here doesn't get you into God's grace. You can help a, a, a thousand little ladies across the street in downtown San Diego, you're not any closer to God's grace than you were because you don't earn God's grace. Because it's grace, it has to be given. And the good thing is that it is. It, it would be different if God says, you know, uh, I know you guys are a bunch of lunkheads and uh, I know you're going to need help, but uh, you're going to have to earn it. We do that, right? We expect people to earn our love, earn our devotion, earn our respect. Jesus says, look, I'm going to give it to you. It's up to you whether or not you accept it. See, the Bible tells us that everybody sins and that nobody's perfect. I know, I know. I can hear right now. Oh, but Jerry, Jerry, we were sure you were perfect. I know, I know. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <clears throat> and if any of you thought that, you need to see a doctor. Or up your medication or get medication or something. Look at Romans 3.23. Everyone has sinned. All fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, the word everyone there means you and me, everyone. In fact, if you look at the person sitting on the couch next to you, that's everyone. Daniel, you're part of everyone. I don't know if you, I don't know if you were aware of that. You've moved up in the world. You're part of everyone now. Johnny, you're part of everyone. Amen. Okay, you guys, Scott, Chuck, everyone. All right? We have all sinned. We've all come short of God's glory. Every one of us. The penalty for that sin is separation from God. There is no way, God is so pure, so holy, that there is no way that our sin can be with him. And that's why he sent his son Jesus, because somebody had to tear apart that rift. <laughs> I love this. If we claim that we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar. And showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So if you ever get arrogant enough to say, well, I never sin. First of all, all of us are going to laugh at you. Okay, We're all going to laugh at you. We may hey, lay hands on you and forget to pray. 
Well, when I was in college, we went over to Orange Coast College, a bunch of the guys from my quad. And we had one guy who thought, <clears throat> he didn't know anything about Kung Fu, but he thought he did. He was always doing this kind of stuff in the, in the dorm. So we went over to Orange Coast College and we saw Bruce Lee Film Festival. Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan movies, like four of them in a row. It's awesome. We get back about one o'clock in the morning. And as we're walking down the hallway, me and a couple of guys were saying, we're going to have to take care of Dwight. That's his name, Dwight. Dwight's going to think he's a kung fu master after watching these movies and he's going to try this stuff on us. So we kind of went a little ahead of him. And our, our, our quad, you had to go down the sixth floor hallway, fifth floor hallway and go down a flight of stairs to get into our quad. And as we got down to the bottom of the quad, we all jumped on him. You are not Bruce Lee. Don't be trying that stuff on us. We will kick your tail in. Run, run, leave me alone. Because he knew he was gonna. None of us are perfect. And if we think we are, we're like Dwight come back from the Bruce Lee Film Festival. Somebody's going to kick our tail in and tell us we're not. So what's the takeaway of this? What do we do with this? Okay, it's a cool story, bro. And? What does it mean to me? See, I'm one of those guys that I firmly believe that once I give you a, a, a sermon... You ought to have something to chew on. You ought to have something you got to take away with you and that's got to really, eh, maybe even kick your tail in for a few days. That's good. That's my job. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Actually, nobody pays me to do this. So we don't want to end with, everybody's a sinner. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks, Jerry. That really is encouraging. Because not only do I suck, but everybody sucks. Everybody's a sinner. All right, great. But there's more to it than that. Psalm 103, verse 8 through 13. The Lord, I love this verse. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to be angry, and filled with unfailing love. I love that. He will not constantly accuse us or remain angry forever. Like we talked about yesterday, Jeff. That God's not, God doesn't hold grudges against us. He doesn't punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. I love this. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. You guys ought to highlight that part in your Bible. Psalm 103. That the Lord has mercy for us. He cares for us. <clears throat> God has every right to judge us and look down on us and, and just banish us to hell. He has every right. Instead, he chose not just to love us, but to love us in such a way that it cost him. That's amazing to me. You know, I got two sons. I wouldn't sacrifice either one of their lives for you guys. Not that I don't love you, I do. But I'm not sacrificing my kids for you. But God sacrificed his for us. And here's the thing. He sacrificed his son for us, and we had nothing to offer him. He did it because he loved us. I'm reading a book right now about the Borgias, the Pope Alexander VI, the, way back in the old days. Everything was about why, everything they did was about, well, you did this because, I, I did this for you because I want you to do something back for me. And that's the way most of us think. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. But God says, you know what? I'll scratch your back. I'm cool. I'm okay. You don't scratch my back. In fact, he believed it so much. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. There's that word again. Everyone. Remember, everyone has sinned. Well, now look at this, everyone. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So Daniel, if you call in the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Johnny? Amen. Chuck? Scott? Okay. 
Because you're part of that everyone too. You're part of the, you're part of the oh crud everyone and the oh cool everyone. It, it works out both ways. Because God's not going to destine all of us to hell. He made a way for us. And he didn't have to do that. That's the amazing thing, is that he didn't have to do it. Maybe you accepted Christ a long time ago. You know that God loves you. You know that God has forgiven you. And there may be people, especially watching this video, that have never understood that. They've never understood that before this morning, before the first time they hear this. And maybe it's the first time that's really ringing in your heart. You know, sometimes we can have a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. I could read a book about all kinds of things. And my head says, okay, I know how to do that. I'm watching videos on YouTube trying to figure out how to rekey locks. I could tell you the process, but after three days of trying, I still have yet to rekey a lock correctly. Those little pins are really tiny and they make me want to take a hostage. So, all of that goes on in us. And then, we just need to go from that head knowledge to a heart knowledge. Knowing that Christ died for us is not the same thing as embracing that he died for us. Letting that sink into your heart. When is the last time you, you sat and truly thought about the death of Christ and, and what it meant for you. Uh, I heard the story about a missionary that was in Africa somewhere and he's telling the story of Christ's crucifixion and, and a woman got up and ran out of the room. And the, 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 the missionary's wife chased after her and said, what's the matter, what's the matter? She said, please don't ever tell me that story again. It's too horrible. That man did nothing and they killed him. When is the last time you thought of Jesus on the cross that way? He did nothing wrong. But he's on the cross because of you and because of me. Because he loves us. See, it's really easy to get caught up in the corporate. Well, the Lord died for the world. Hallelujah. How about this? Jesus died on the cross for Jerry. Jesus died on the cross for Chuck, for Scott. Put your name there. That, that brings it home a little bit more. That makes it a little more real. Wherever you stand in this process, God wants you to understand that he wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to accept his, his forgiveness. If you've done that before, he wants you to go to the next step. Because after forgiveness, there's that part of moving ahead. And there's also the part of forgiving other people. This is when it really becomes the F word. That forgiveness thing. You know, Jerry, I, I, I'm willing to accept that God can forgive me, but I don't, I don't, I'm not forgiving other people. Nuts of them, they're on their own. Uh, quite work that way. Look at Matthew 6, 14. In fact, we talked about it yesterday in my office. If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ow. It's like a gut punch. You ever read a verse in the Bible and think, I really wish I hadn't read that. I would have been a lot better off without this knowledge. Thank you. Too much information, God. So when Peter goes to Jesus and said, hey, this guy is really bugging me. How often do I have to forgive this guy? He's a real jerk, Jesus. And how long do I have to forgive? How many times? In fact, I'll be generous, Jesus. I'll give this guy seven times. I'll forgive this guy seven times. Jesus says, nah, that's not going to work. How about, let's start with 70 times 7. And you can see Peter doing the math in his head. 
Wait, 490? I'm not, I'm not, I have to forgive this guy 490 times? What Peter misunderstood is that doesn't mean that guy's going to be bad 490 times. That means that Peter's going to be bad 490 times. Peter's going to need that much forgiveness. And it's almost like Jesus said, yeah, let's start with that and see where we go. By the way, that doesn't mean you get to walk around with a, with a you know, little notepad. All right, Johnny, that's 489. <laughs> One more time, baby, and you are dead. Right? Because as soon as I limit my forgiveness of Johnny, God limits his forgiveness of me. The Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, you forgive me the same way I forgive others. So if Scotty makes me mad, and I... Not that you ever do. <laughs> okay? But if Scotty makes me mad, if I make Scotty beg and crawl for my forgiveness, then I'm telling God it's okay for him to make me beg and crawl for his forgiveness. Or something Yeah. Or, or if I don't forgive him. See, so that's why we had that dust up the other day. Yeah. But why did I forgive you? Because I need forgiveness. Yeah. See? See how it works? So we're, we're all equal. You mess up. I mess up. We mess up. So I have to forgive you because I'm in the same boat. I can't afford to tell you, well, you know, you're going to have to earn your forgiveness because then God's going to tell me, all right, you got to earn your forgiveness, God. See, I, wanna, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. You can't earn forgiveness. You can only give it. So if you forgive those who sin against you, God will forgive you. And if you don't forgive, guess what? You're hotter than one of those jalapeno poppers we had the other day. That seems a day though, dude. That was good. Really good. <laughs> but you could still, like, you could still try. I mean, like, if you do somebody wrong and you know it in your heart and you get convicted and you feel the conviction, you could not so much earn it, but you could try hard with that person, right? I mean, that's still. Well, you go to them and ask for forgiveness. Yeah. See, that, that's, that's when you take that step. And most of us would rather girdle razor blades than ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And actions speak louder than words. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, because you get two little kids fighting in kindergarten. Johnny hits Bobby. Not you, Johnny. Well, you, you probably did, though. Okay. Johnny hits Bobby, and he's like, what do you, Johnny, tell him you're sorry. I'm sorry. He didn't mean that. He didn't mean that at all. He's thinking in his head, next time, I'm going to hit you where the teacher can't see it, and if you tattle, I'll hit you again. Right? That's not, that's not repentance. Repentance is going, realize, okay, I'm going this way. And they go, oh, crud, that's the wrong way. There's bad stuff there. I'm going to go this way where there's good. That's repentance. And you can't be truly forgiven until you repent. That's why the Bible tells us to repent of our sins. Not just say, I'm sorry. But to change our direction. I love this quote I found. Uh, and I'd never heard of this guy, but I found this quote by E.H. Chapin. Never does the human soul appear so strong and noble as when it foregoes revenge and dares to forgive an injury. Wow. Look, I've been hurt by people. I've been, I've been hurt plenty of times in my life. So it's not like I've lived this, this perfect life and everything's been, been roses for me. I've been down a road. And the only thing that keeps me going is forgiving. Because it just... I used to say that life's too short to bear a grudge. I was wrong. Life's too long. You carry that grudge. You're mad about. You're mad at somebody. They're fat, dumb, and happy somewhere else. They don't even know you're mad at them anymore. And if they do know, they may not care. So in the meantime, you're walking around with all this poison in your system. All this stuff that's hurting you keeps you awake. It keeps you churned up and and and, and ticked off all the time. And they're living their life, and they don't care. That subway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I'm weird or something. Elizabeth Elliot uh, and her husband Jim had flown into some really dense jungle, jungles in northern Ecuador to work with the Aka Indian tribe. The men of the tribe speared her husband and four other missionaries to death. Elizabeth Elliot, along with Rachel Saint, the sister of another one of the martyrs, went back to work with the Aachen people. So, 
they, they flew into Ecuador. The locals killed her husband and four other guys, and the sister of one of the guys that died and the wife of one of the guys that died went back to work with them. They made it clear they didn't want to prosecute the murders, but they just wanted to love them. They were willing to forgive and forget because of that numerous members of that tribe and even surrounding tribes came to know Christ as their Savior. Wow. So, I'm going to give you an invitation this morning. If you've been going through life unable to forgive someone for the wrong they did to you, forgive them. In fact, that's really not an invitation as much as uh, get off your death and do it. You gotta forgive. You can't hold this stuff in your heart. You're just gonna eat yourself alive. If you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins or if you've kind of lost track of them along the way, do that now. Do that today. It's not a hard thing. See, when it comes down to it, the invitation is to let go of the feelings that weigh you down and to trust God with all you are and all you have. And that's the cool thing is that we go through this stuff and, and it just, I don't know about you, but it just weighs on us. When I've got things going on, man, it just, I, I can't sleep. All kinds of stuff, it messes with my stomach, my stomach hurts. And God says, you know what? You don't have to do that. You don't have to live that way. We get depressed, we get you know, all these things that go on inside us, and God says, you know what? You're carrying a burden that I'll carry for you. If you're walking around out here with a 150-pound pack, and I say, well, here, let me help you with that. Say, no, no, I got it. I'm just going to suffer through it. Hallelujah. Well, you're stupid. Let somebody help you. Let somebody else. Because here's the thing. You can carry 150 pounds, or you can carry 75. Because we're in this together. That's what this is all about. And I love what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. God is not trying to weigh you down and and just make your life miserable. In fact, he's doing the opposite. He wants to make your life better. But I really believe that, that what we're talking about today is the key. I really believe that forgiveness is the key for us. It's the key to accepting Christ. And then it's the key to unburdening our lives. And it's the key to staying in God's good grace. Forgive, forgive other people, ask God to forgive you, and forgive yourself. Yeah, see, when you have people that, one of the ones that struggles, when you have somebody that attacks you and hurts you, and you're trying to forgive them, but you know in your heart that they did it out of revenge, and, and despite how, like most of the times when somebody just does something to me, and I can tell, like I can put myself in their shoes. Like it was an accident and, or something. And, yeah, and able to forgive myself, like, you know, hey, I could have done the same thing, you know, in enough pain in my life and, and hurting or, or to try to find um, happiness. I did this to them or right. I did this and it ended up affecting them and hurt them. Sure. And that's how I could put myself in their shoes and say, okay, they were probably doing the same thing to me because I probably wasn't that great of a guy. You know? Right, right. But when you got somebody that in despite is coming to attack you, it just gets you just to get you. Yeah. Do you know any of the tools, I mean, besides Jesus' love and, and he asks everybody to love each other, how do you how do you forgive somebody? I mean, you could say, hey, I forgive them, but deep in your heart, I mean, you need to be able to let that go. You, what are some tools? Do you That's know any a, tools to try to get through those ones? You, you said it right then. Yeah. Jesus' love. Look, I'm not going to love you without Jesus. I'm just not. I'm, I'm, if left to my own devices, man, I'm pretty much... I'm pretty much a curmudgeon. I'm pretty much a guy like, you know, hey, get off my lawn kind of guy, okay? So I've had people that, that just purposely hurt me. Yeah, those are the ones that are hard. Oh, it's hard. It's brutal. And you may, when it first happens, you may not be willing 
to do it, to, to forgive them. That's when you got to pray, God, make me willing. And then, and here's the other thing that I do, Chuck, and I think this will give you some insight. I start praying for that person. Pretty hard to hate somebody you're praying for because God softens your heart. If they did that to you, that says more about them than it does to you. They did something to hurt you like that. That's, that says a awful lot about them. They're just bad people or they're spiteful or whatever. Well, they need Jesus. And so when I, when I run into somebody like that that's, that's, that's ugly and honorary and stuff, I just, I know, first of all, I feel sorry for them because that's a pretty lonely way to live. Most of them are pretty lonely the way they live. And if you scratch a bully deep enough, you find a coward. So I just start praying, God, I had a chief deputy at the sheriff's office, and he, he didn't like me. I wasn't crazy about him either. And uh, God really, I was because I would, I would pray on the way to work every morning, pray for the people and stuff. And every day, God brought this guy's name to me. And I'm like, I don't want to pray for this guy anymore, God. <laughs> so finally, I went to him one day, and I, I just walked into his office and said, hey, chief, you got a second? He goes, yeah. He said, I, want you, I, just, I just want you to know I, I'm praying for you. And he got the funniest look on his face. He said, why am, am I in trouble? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on in your life. I just know that every morning on my way into work, as I'm praying for the sheriff's department and people here, I said, God, God gives me your name. And I, and I say a special prayer for you. And he said, okay, thanks. And I walked out and I went, that's the... I, if I had talked about his mama, I could have messed him up more than that. Did it change him? Did it help? For a while. But in the end, he was who he was. He was just a bitter, bitter guy. And, you know, I didn't change his attitude about me as much as I changed my attitude about him. Because I can't control his attitude. I can only control my attitude. I can only control my heart. And... The Bible says, as far as you can do it, be at peace with everyone. I can't make everybody like me. And there are people that don't like me. I know that's, again, I know that's hard to believe. But there are people who don't like me. Probably sitting in this room. I like you. <laughs> that doesn't say much for your character. <laughs> okay? But, but think about it. That's, that's, so that, but that's, a, that's an important question because everybody feels that. Okay, I'll forgive everybody, but this guy got this guy over here. I don't like. But what what the scriptures say before? If you don't forgive men, you won't be forgiven. There's no like comma there that says forgive everybody, but that little jerk over there because he really deserves it. No, he says you got to forgive everyone. I wish he didn't say that because there are people I would like to hate. I would like to, I would like to hate somebody. <laughs> Feels good. <laughs> yeah. I would like to hate somebody other than the Green Bay Packers. I would like to hate them. <laughs> I don't even hate the Green Bay Packers. I just, I don't like them. How about the Raiders? <laughs> nah, I don't care about the Raiders. I used to be a Raider fan. So I don't you don't like Green Bay? Oh, I'm a Bears fan. You can't like Green Bay and be a Bears fan. They drum me out of the, out of the core. <laughs> so, so here's where it comes down to. We're going to accept God's forgiveness. And then we're going to give that forgiveness to other people. And we're going to forgive ourselves. And all those things, by the way, you talk about how hard it is to forgive somebody who's, who's purposely hurt you. The hardest thing of all of that is to forgive ourselves. Ah, oh, you're so stupid. Jerry, why'd you do that? Because I'm stupid. Pure and simple. Wish there was a better answer for it, but there's not. question is, are you going to let God do something big in you? It's up to you. Okay, so this is a big one. It's the F word, but it's an ugly one. Let's pray. God, thanks. Lord, this is a hard message. I get it. It's a rough one for us. But God, you wouldn't call us to it if you weren't going to give us the strength to do it. You wouldn't tell us to forgive if you weren't going to give us the strength to forgive. 
You wouldn't require us to be forgiven if you weren't going to forgive us. So I thank you for that, God. Now, Father, I pray for our hearts that we will forgive, that our hearts will forgive. I pray, God, that we would open our hearts to you, that we would open our hearts to the people around us that need your forgiveness so badly. God, thanks. You know, just take a minute right now. And, and so the first thing, ask God to forgive you your sins. If you haven't done that before, ask God to forgive you your sins. God, please forgive me. And then, if you've got somebody that's hurt you badly, just begin releasing that. Say, God, I, I, I just, I don't want to carry this anymore. I don't want to hurt like this anymore. And let God begin the process of healing that. Now, that may not happen overnight. It may happen right this minute and you're fine. But it may take a little bit of time. But you've just got to keep praying that, God, I want to forgive. Help me forgive. And then finally, ask God to help you forgive yourself. Look, a lot of the problems we have, we did to ourselves. We know that. And that's why we're so hard on ourselves. But if God can forgive you, he wants you to forgive you. Because Satan will kick your tail end around with your past sin. And all you've got to do is remember that you've already been forgiven for that. And it's separated from us. Go back and read Psalm 103. God, thanks. Do something in us, God. Thanks. We love you, Father. Amen. 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 All right.